Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. I just thought I might test the sound. Have, can you all hear me? Can you please put in the chat box to say whether the sound is well? I don't have Ashley on yet, so usually I test the sound with him. So could you maybe let me know? Is the sound well? How Can you hear me? Beautiful. All good. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I must admit, I've been scarred by previous experiences where I've joined a webinar as the only presenter, and I just started talking, and after a while, I realized um, <laughs> that I uh, nobody could hear me. So thank you very much. So welcome to our second webinar in our series on ESG and sustainability. Um, now, in our second webinar today, we'll be talking about establishing a roadmap and start the current state assessment. So it's all about assessing. So it's the, the second webinar in a series of six. Uh, so my fellow presenter um, for the ESG webinars um, is Ashley Bleeker. Um, you know, with school holidays and all the commitments around children, he might just be running a little bit late, but uh, we'll be pushing ahead. And, and when Ashley joins, I'm sure we'll hear him. Uh, so that's the, the normal presenters. Now, our ESG webinar series, last month, we talked about demystifying the ESG process. This month, we're talking about applying a framework to ESG reporting. Then we go on to stakeholder engagement. We then look at measuring to manage, uh, pulling it all together in July and in August, assurance um, over your ESG report. So. Let's start with a recap um, of our uh, webinar um, last time or in, on, in March, and that was around demystifying the ESG process. So we started off by talking about what is the business problem? And we said, in short, the business problem was around access to capital access to markets and access to people. Um, and I think it's a really simple explanation of what we are seeing ourselves, BDO, but also what our clients are telling us. It could be access uh, to capital in the form um, of equity investors or financing from financiers. It could be access to markets, uh, so clients and customers, or access to people, to people to work in your business. We also discussed the focus on net zero. And, and we know at COP26, um, a number of countries made a commitment to net zero by 2050 um, at, at the latest. And we talked about what the status is in Australia. And since our previous webinar, um, there was a budget handed down by our government and I was very sad to see that there was nothing significant in that budget uh, to address ESG and sustainability. Um, you know, I, I was hoping to see something in the budget around investment in innovation and technology to help Australia and Australian entities achieve um, net zero commitments. Um, but there was nothing in the budget on that or, you know, tinkering on the edges only. Uh, we then went on and said, okay, net zero and climate change is one of a large number of ESG factors. And therefore, we explored what are the other factors. So we looked at 23 other factors. So there was eight in, around the environment, eight around social, eight around governance. So diversity, modern slavery, etc. And then we spent quite a bit of time looking at examples of ESG and sustainability reporting. So we focused on examples that we could find within Australia, Australian entities, and extracted some of the um, disclosures currently around E, environment aspects, social aspects, and governance aspects to kind of pull it all together. And then we ended with kind of the question, where do you start? And in our view, we suggested that the first step is to come up with an ESG roadmap. 
And then together with that is to add a timeline to your ESG roadmap. So that's where we ended the end of webinar one. And we also asked you to do a little bit of homework in preparation for today's webinar. So I hope you've got the time to look at that. Um, and we pick it up today um, where we just do a little bit of a recap on that ESG process. So um, if you remember correctly, around 75, or if I remember correctly, and you would also remember, that around 75% of our attendees last time indicated that either they haven't started with the sustainability report or sustainability journey, or they're actually working on the preparation of the inaugural sustainability report. So 75% of attendees only starting. Only 25% have prepared a sustainability report in the past and or had some level of assurance expressed over it. So we were also saying we would be very keen to learn from them. So if we recap, so where do we start? What did we say last time? So we came up with um, an overview, um, a six step approach on what an ESG roadmap could look like. And we said in the first bucket, we had assess. So that is establish your current state for ESG activities. So if you break it down in some key activities, is conduct a desktop review of your current ESG strategies, initiatives and monitoring slash reporting systems. And that's what we've asked you to look at. Um, we also said what policies, procedures are already in place across HR, et cetera, um, that if you look at it through an ESG lens or through ESG glasses, um, you know, you would say, hang on, we've got great things in place and it actually also ticks the ESG bucket. And then we also ask the question, what metrics are currently captured for other purposes? So for example, di um, diversity and inclusion data. So it was all about looking at assessing. The second step is around prioritize. So let's do a materiality assessment methodology consultation. Let's reach out to our stakeholders. Um, let's also consider what are all the frameworks that are available. Um, and then um, when we del after we've delivered stakeholder a consultation, let's collate the findings. Uh, step three is commit leverage current initiatives and develop an ESG strategy. So basically compare um, step one and step two, and the difference is commit, you know, what are we gonna do to fill the gaps? In step four, we look at measuring our ESG maturity. And um, again, you know, if we had a certain target and we compare it with reality based on our measurements, you know, what is that gap? How do we have to move and how will we cross that gap? What strategies do we put in place? And then the first step, and that's where we want to get to, let's say around September, October this year, when you issue your audited financial statements is also all, um, issued together with that, a sustainability report. Um, so the, the outcome, we've got five steps to get to that very first sustainability report. And then we've got also step six, which is around improving. And the long game and what we're actually trying to achieve here is ongoing improvement, continuous improvement across the ESG matters um, uh, that matter to your stakeholder and that matter to you as a business. Um, however, in the short term, I would say in the short to medium term, the next six months, most of our clients, if not all of them, are focusing on steps one to five. Um, so that's where we left it last time, that they, this is an example of a roadmap. Um, and we also suggested uh, that we overlay a time frame to it or a timeline, so we've got deadlines in place. Um, so if you're looking at finalizing your audited financials of 30 June 2022 financial year, and you're gonna finalize it by end of September, October, and that is therefore also the due date for this first sustainability report. If we work back, you know, what are the things we have to do over the next five to six months? 
Um, I think two things has happened um, when people looked at this timeline. Number one, some people said, um, you know, this looks very ambitious. Um, we are still finding our feet on ESG, what it is. Um, it looks very ambitious to get it done uh, together with our 30 June 2022 uh, financial statements. So some people have said, listen, it's just not achievable. Um, and then others have said, listen, we really have to jump into action very quickly. Let's get started. Um, I think it might be a good idea to just reflect. Um, nobody is expecting, or remember this is all voluntary, not subject to audit or assurance. Nobody is expecting that first sustainability report um, to have all the bells and all the whistles and to have fancy targets and absolutely um, amazing achievements. Um, so I think if you're trying to, uh, if, if you're scared off because you are thinking it's just too much, the expectation is too much, too much work, um, maybe it is, you know, lower expectations um, and saying, listen, for September, October, if I can use a sport and a cricket analogy, we just want to open the batting. We want to come out with a baseline report on all the great things we're currently doing. Um, you don't have to put in targets, you don't have to put in strategies, but just this is a really good summary of what we're currently doing and what we're already doing. And we take ESG and sustainability serious, it's important to our business. I think that would be a good approach um, because we are seeing this landscape changing really quickly. If you come back to that business problem, um, you know, markets, uh, customers, clients, and people, your staff, are really interested in this. Um, and I'm, I'm quite concerned that if we delay the preparation of the sustainability report, you know, it could have, um, you know, negative implications. So I think it is, we're not going for the Royals Royce in September, October, but let's go for an achievable and a manageable um, and, and realistic um, transparent sustainability report, September, October, for example. Um, I know another thing is many organizations um, are currently struggling with staff shortages. It's, it's a real thing. Um, as you know, a lot of uh, sh shortages across all industries um, in Australia, something that we didn't think we'll ever see. Um, you know, so again, if you think about your staff shortages, um, and if you think about, you know, this is a quite a tight deadline, I think it's lowering expectations to make it achievable. Um, I really think, um, you know, it could be, um, you know, a bit of a risk not to do anything. Um, another alternative is to uh, maybe do a very basic, you know, even more, a very, very short and basic sustainability report to get it on your website, to have some kind of declaration when you speak to suppliers. Um, so it's just, let's think about that. And, and, and if you're delaying it, are you delaying it um, by a year? Or are you, of, are you thinking of doing a sustainability report early next year? And then another one again in September. So, you know, I think we should just think strategically um, about it a bit. Happy to discuss it with you. So please reach out to me. So a current state assessment. So what we've said is we start with um, a current state um, assessment and we look at, um, you know, things we already have in place. Now, as I said to you earlier uh, uh, last month, um, Ashley and I are actually working um, with some of our ESG sustainability colleagues across BDO Australia. Uh, to prepare the very first sustainability ESG report for BDO Australia. Um, and we ha have just completed our current state assessment and it was really fascinating on the things we've seen. Um, we're a people business, um, you know, our why is people helping people achieve their dreams. Um, so it's all about our people and also the people we're helping, the clients we're helping. Um, therefore, you, you would expect a business like us would have a lot of things already in play around people and like clients. And that's what we found. Um, so we went and we looked at, at, at um, 
policies and procedures that are already in place across our business. Um, so, you know, you could go and look at operations. So what do we do around procurement? Because we also procure subcontractors to work with us. We um, procure um, IT people to work with us. Um, your business could potentially look at what you do around waste management. Um, in our business, for example, what do we do around paper? So we've already gone paperless a number of years ago. And similar to most of you during COVID, I think we've gone completely paperless uh, because even the last people who were still hanging on to paper uh, and wanted to print everything couldn't do it uh, during COVID. So we, I think we've accelerated paper management um, in our business, for example. But you know, waste management, um, if you're in manufacturing um, or, or in other areas, what do you do with waste? Um, if you've got an organization, um, agriculture, again, if there's water, where do the water go? Are the water contaminated? Um, you know, does it have an impact on water sources close to your business, et cetera? Um, so around operations, based on the nature of your organization, you might be doing quite amazing things. Um, the next one is around human resources. Now at BDO, because we're a people business, we found amazing stuff that we already do in human resources around ESG and sustainability. So we have policies in place around diversity and inclusion. Um, we have policies in place around modern slavery. Um, you know, we have policies and processes in place around engaging with our staff. So we get feedback from our staff um, at least once a year on, on, on what they think of BDO, how connected they are with BDO, and they give direction <coughs> to the things we do at BDO. So I think, you know, a lot of that you would also have in your organization, get feedback from your staff. <coughs> Another thing that I think we do really well in Australia in general, is occupational health and safety. So all those things that you do around occupational health and safety could come um, under um, our social part of ESG. Um, during the pandemic, um, BDO and I know many entities have spent a lot of time and energy on looking after or supporting mental health um, of our staff. Um, and running programs that people could know they can speak to people, um, trying to um, make sure there's some connectivity. You know, especially for us in Melbourne, uh, where we've gone through the longest lockdown in the world, uh, we um, or our HR team rolled out some quite amazing things um, for staff to still feel connected, um, to, to, to catch up. Now, all of those things, really important. Um, as part of ESG, because it's how we look after our people um, and our employee engagement. Um, so I would say, go and look at all your HR policies. Um, I took a bit of a shortcut, is I, and, and I would suggest you do this as a practical tip, go and speak to the head of your HR department um, and ask them to just give you an overview of all the things they do to look after your people your your staff and they can give you a really good overview and then i would say okay you've told me about all these things can you send me the policies to support it so i can read it but i got a really good idea of everything that's available um just by speaking to them so i i'm finding this current state assessment it's first of all finding out what are the areas you want to look at um and finding out who's the head of each area have a conversation with them i usually schedule a, you know an hour meeting with all of the heads of these areas ask them some questions and maybe start with what esg is what we're trying to achieve and say you know we're looking to uncover all that magic that you're doing that could fit into our esg agenda um so hr is a is a rich area for organizations um it now, if you look at a head of IT, they would be able to tell you what they do around data security, cyber security, a privacy of your information, of your client data, of your data. 
some amazing stuff again around the IT space and governance around IT or data strategy. Um, again, you know, rich areas there. Um, what you, we also have at BDO around IT, um, our IT team roll out training for our employees. Um, that is good for obviously the work environment to keep information safe, but it's also good for our employees to keep their own personal information safe. So, you know, phishing attacks, um, um, how to see that a text message or an email um, is not from a person that that um, that is a legitimate um, email or text message, those kind of things. So again, there are a lot of these programs that organizations regularly run that is linked to ESG and sustainability. We might not think that, but it, true, it is true. The other one is finance. Um, so if you, if you look at uh, finance and you're head of your finance team, and it might be you, is to think about all the policies and procedures you already have in place around um, um, anti-money laundering, um, 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 bribery and corruption, for example, under risk management. There's so many things you already have in place um, that could come under ESG. Uh, risk management, so bribery, corruption, um, how do we look at risk, um, that we've got risk frameworks, um, et cetera. And then the last one around client and customer service. So do we get feedback from our customers and our clients? How regular do we get it? What metrics do we get? Um, you know, if you're a retailer, do our customers uh, complete, you know, after you've done online uh, purchases, there's always a little uh, feedback form. So how many of your customers completed? And if they completed, what's the writing, et cetera? Now at BDO, we do the same thing. Uh, we go out to our clients and ask for feedback and we've got ratings. Um, so you can see trends as well. Um, so really this is about um, in your organization, you'll have a lot of policies and procedures. Um, um, you know, a, another way to address this, uh, so some of our clients, we would say to them, do you have a central spot where you save all your policies and procedures? So firm-wide, uh, business-wide policies and procedures. And I'd say, yes, here it is. I say, can I, um, you know, get a screenshot um, if, if they want to give you access initially, give me a screenshot of all those policies and procedures. And instead of reading all of them, we usually pick the obvious ones that are linked to the things on the screen. Um, and then we start with them and pull out the ESG aspects. Um, but you can look at all of them and, and just go through and see is there anything of interest. Um, the other thing that is um, Interesting, some businesses, for example, those with an AFSL license, um, they have certain things that ha they have to do for their regulator, uh, for ASIC, etc. And embedded in there are a lot of amazing stuff um, around ESG and sustainability. Um, so it's also good to maybe think um, what regulations govern your business. Um, maybe you're a business in, in natural resources or mining and there's environmental legislation that you have to comply with. So what legislation do you have to comply with? Therefore, what do you measure? What do you do in order to comply with that legislation? And usually that type of legislation, environmental legislation, would be closely linked to the E and ESG. Um, you know, if you are an aged care provider, for example, uh, there would be a number of legislation um, and regulations that you have to comply with. And I assume like an aged care provider get customer feedback. Um, uh, you know, so there's a lot of very interesting stuff um, that you already do. And it's to uncover that. Um, the next point is what metrics are currently captured for other purposes, for other purposes. So you know, when I speak to um, our head of HR or the head of IT or the head of finance, I would ask them, tell me about the policies and procedures that you have in place. Tell me what you think would link to ESG and sustainability, and I'll let the conversation go. Uh, but that 
as they tell me about things, I would say, okay, that's amazing. Uh, we've got a policy around diversity. Um, so what? how do you measure it? Do we measure gender um, at the different levels in the organization or is it just total males, total females? Do we do total male partners versus female partners, senior managers, male, female? You know, what level do you measure it? Um, do you look at trends? Do you report that? Um, you know, another angle is potentially to look at, you know, what's being reported to the board. Often these heads of all these areas on a regular basis to report to the board of your organization. So what in there is potentially linked to ESG and sustainability? Um, now I'm trying to just generate ideas. This is all different to different organizations, but a current state assessment is an attempt to uncover what, what's already in place. Because the last thing we want to do through ESG and sustainability is to come up with fancy ideas and the business turn around and say it's already in place, or we're doing something similar, or this is a slightly different thing. Often the things in place are even better than we can imagine and we can suggest um, from an um, you know from our perspective. So really important. Um, to connect. Uh, I think the other thing about this current state assessment is if you do it through interviews and discussions with these people, it makes your job faster because they can point you in the right direction, but also you take them on the journey. So in future, when they come up with a new HR policy, they could potentially speak to the ESG people and say, listen, uh, around people, we talked about this do you have any input? Is there anything you think you could add so that we don't just meet our HR goals and objectives, but also meet what you want to achieve around ESG and sustainability? Uh, another one that's not on the slide that I'm just thinking of is community engagement. Um, you know, a lot of organizations um, try and give back to the community around them. So how do your organization do that? Um, for example, some um, organizations give staff a day or two days a year off to go and help the local community, maybe build schools, go and paint a school. I know after the, um, the fires, the bushfires, um, you know, there were um, some organizations that gave staff an extra day of annual leave, but you had to use that day of annual leave to go and visit a bushfire affected area and actually spend your money there and help local businesses. Um, so those kind of initiatives are amazing initiatives um, that should be included. Um, some groups have special activities around uh, children of employees, um, another one that could be, could be flagged, um, but how do you give back to the community? Um, and, and I think that's really important. Um, maybe it is you raise funds for various not-for-profit organizations throughout the year. Maybe you encourage staff um, over a Christmas time to contribute to a not-for-profit organization that work with children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things are really important around ESG and sustainability. Um, obviously, the environmental side, I think those of you from an environmental perspective, those of you who do a lot of things there, it, you know, you will have environmental list or people in that space um, doing work. Um, you know, that could be, um, you know, what do you do with packaging? Um, you know, if you are packaging your products, um, you know, can it be recycled? So what do you do around that? Obviously, waste management. Uh, the other thing uh, around environment, obviously, is, you know, what do you do around net zero? Um, are you thinking about a net zero commitment? Um, quite often, the starting point is to do at least a scope one um, emissions or carbon measurement. Uh, so looking at the fuel that you use in your organization, look at business travel, in your organization, um, you know, and look at the levels, the base levels, and hopefully we could decrease that going forward, um, use less fuel, uh, use alternative forms of fuel. I know hydrogen 
um, is a topic of conversation at the moment. So current state assessment, I hope I've given you a few ideas on what you could do around current state assessment. I think it might be a good time to do a poll. Um, so I'll try and run a poll. Um, my first poll, um, based on what you've done over the last month in your organization, what level of activity do you think could be characterized as ESG related behavior? So if you've looked at all these areas, you've done some work in your organization, um, what do you think? What levels um, are your organization at? Is it a low level of ESG ready? Is it maybe a moderate level, a high level, or you know, significant, better than a high level? You are really ready for ESG. Thank you very much for participating in the polls. I think it's really interesting for me, but also for all the other attendees um, to see what the general um, experience and view is. Um, I think sometimes when we start on a journey like this, we get a little bit worried when we looked at our business and maybe activity is not great. Um, but if you can see like, listen, uh, this is where everybody's at. It maybe sets some realistic at targets or realistic expectations. So fantastic. Um, if anybody want to vote, I'll, I'll give you another, let's say five uh, seconds to vote and then I'll share. So five, four, three, two, one, and we close it and I'll share it. And there you can see um, quite interesting, um, you know, a low level of ESG ready behavior, a uh, very high, uh, we've got, um, I just want to move it so I can see the percentages a bit better. It's too small on my screen. Um, a moderate level, 50%. Now, interesting, a low or moderate level of ESG ready behavior is sitting at 87%. Uh, so there's a huge room for improvement. Um, high level, 9% and significant 3%, quite amazing. Um, congratulations to those organizations on achieving high and significant levels of ESG behavior. Um, please let me know what are the great things you're doing. Please let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Please email me or through LinkedIn. Let me know maybe what, what are some of the best things uh, you do that you could share with us. Even in the chat box, if you want to put in there some of the best things you're doing that you think the rest of us could benefit from, please do that. Um, to those, you know, the low and moderate level, 87% of our attendees, um, I think there's an opportunity um, for him to, to improve. Um, and it's actually exciting when we work in this space. Um, I really like it because I like change and I think we're making a difference here. And there's this big opportunity to make a difference. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, that's amazing. Um, then, current state, you know, financial statements capturing um, ESG performance. Um, now, if we look at financial statements um, and audited financial statements usually, these financial statements um, usually prepared in accordance with IFRS and Australian accounting standards already capture quite a bit of information around ESG performance. And these standards that I've quoted here don't talk about ESG, they don't talk about sustainability, but if you read the words, it also captures um, ESG and sustainability in a more implied way. For example, if you look at obsolete inventories, um, if you've got inventories that become obsolete, um, you know, we have to impair them. Absolutely, inventories could be impaired uh, as a result of ESG reasons. Um, you know, we could have impairment of assets in IS 36 because we've got assets that are emission intensive. There's new technology um, that will not be emission intensive and therefore our current assets have to be impaired. Or if you look at IS 16, it might be 
um, that we've got these assets that got an expected useful life of 10 years. However, due to innovation, <coughs> we are working on the development of better technology and therefore the expected useful life of existing assets decrease from 10 years to three years, which has an accounting consequence. Uh, it could be that we've got <coughs> the research and development activities and costs that we incur. Um, and that IAS 38 says all of this research and development costs that you incur, sometimes it have to be expense research, and sometimes it can be capitalized uh, because there will be some benefit if we can get to better technology, etc. Um, so a number of ESG sustainability related information does have an impact on financials, are already included in financials uh, through these standards. Just a few examples. However, and I think this is important, is that there are actually more stakeholders out there. So not just investors and financiers who look at financial statements. There are more stakeholders and they want more information. You know, so that if we look at the information needs um, uh, of, of um, the users of financial statements, usually the people who look at financial statements and the primary users per the conceptual framework are investors and, and lenders, financiers. However, uh, we know that general purpose financial reports do not and cannot provide all the information that investors and financiers are interested in. We know they are interested in other information, non-financial information. Therefore, these financial statements, um, although they're trying to capture ESG and sustainability related matters, and they do to some extent capture it, they don't deal with all the information needs of the primary users of financial statements. And this second bullet point is actually from the conceptual framework. The conceptual framework underpinning accounting standards and financial statements actually acknowledge that those statements do not and cannot provide all the information. So I think that's important. Um, the other thing that's important is we don't just have, um, you know, investors and financiers, we've got more stakeholders. Uh, we've got suppliers, uh, we've got customers, we've got regulators, industry groups, we've got the community, we've got the workforce, um, we've got government departments. And I've given you some examples there. And all of these stakeholders are looking for greater transparency from entities about long-term sustainability and their ESG impact. Um, so, Financiers, investors, um, you know, they get some information, but they want more. But there are also all these other stakeholders um, that are not interested necessarily in financial information, but they're interested in sustainability and ESG information. So again, and I've said this um, before, and I, I just want to reiterate, I do believe the solution is holistic communication. I mean, the whole purpose why organizations prepare financial statements is and has always been to communicate with shareholders and financiers through audited financial statements that comply with accounting standards in order to give the big picture and the full picture to these investors and financiers and also to give the full picture to all of these stakeholders including our people our clients um, it is to prepare um, voluntarily prepared ESG and sustainability reports. Um, so, you know, I, I truly believe to get to the holistic view of an organization and to attract capital and clients and people, we need to add the sustainability report. Um, one of the shortcomings, sorry, I should just go back. Um, on the, on the left-hand side, we've got financial statements prepared in accordance with IFRS or Australian Accounting Standards. So there's a very clear framework on what you comply with. And no, that was not always the case. 30 years ago when I started, uh, you know, there were so many different accounting frameworks across the world um, and the International Accounting Standards Committee and now the International Accounting Standards Board, they've just been renamed a few years ago. Um, they 
have very successfully brought all of those frameworks together to get to IFRS. Um, US GAAP is still an outlier, but the rest really converge to IFRS. Now, we're expecting to see something similar on the sustainability side. Because at the moment, you voluntarily prepare these sustainability reports and there's no clear one framework globally. And, and that's actually what I wanted to talk about. What are these available frameworks? Because it's quite important to think about the framework and which framework we want to use. Um, and, and as a business, think which frameworks would be relevant to your business. Um, before I look at all those detailed frameworks, I thought I might ask the question around um, which ESG reporting option um, do you prefer? Um, if you look at ESG reporting, I think there are two different approaches. The one approach, the one at the top, is to include ESG and sustainability information in the financial statements. So somehow put it in the audited financial statements. Now, um, you know, and some of the frameworks work towards that. Um, I think there will always be ESG sustainability impacts on financial statements um, because ESG could impact provisions, impairments, et cetera. But do you want to include numbers around diversity, inclusion, modern slavery, et cetera, as part of financial statements or not? And if it's part of financial statements, it will have to be subject to, to audit at this stage already, et cetera. The second alternative is to have all the ESG and sustainability metrics and reporting in a separate independent sustainability report. Um, so it goes out with your audited financial statements, may be released on the website at the same date as um, audited financial statements, but it's quite separate. Um, it's voluntary, it's separate, and you pick a framework, um, and, and you know at this stage, you don't even need assurance over it. That will come in future. Um, you know, so which approach do you prefer? Um, so we support... Um, a sustainability report that sits independent, but acknowledging that there is an impact on the financial numbers in financial statements. Again, uh, we follow somewhat of a holistic approach, a, a big picture approach. What's the best communication uh, for your stakeholders? Now, if you look at available frameworks, um, the United Nations have developed sustainable development goals. 17 of them, and I love these. Um, you know, they, um, they, they, they short, sharp, simple, um, nice and colorful. Um, I love art and I love color. So, you know, this speaks to me. I love number one, you know, no poverty. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely a, a, a amazing the, the simplicity um, around, you know, no poverty. Um, the, in the next one, I just want to move this a little bit here. Sorry, let's move my screen. Why is this not moving? Anyway, you know, number two, zero hunger. Um, you know, number four, you know, I'm a former academic, quality education. And number five, gender equality. Uh, some amazing stuff. Absolute amazing, simple easy to understand, sustainable development goals. Um, so if you look at these goals, um, there are 17 uh, sustainability-based goals, and they um, would like these to be met by 2030, um, and they are linked to global challenges identified by the UN. If you go to the United Nations website, you can see some amazing videos and information infographics supporting these 17 goals. Um, you know, then, you know, they are flexible and um, you can choose uh, qualitative and quantitative data. I should also say, if you pick this framework, um, the intention is not for every organization to adopt all 17 goals. 
um, because how can you achieve all 17 goals and not all 17 are in your control or something you can influence. Um, so if you look at number 15, life on land, can you influence that? Number 14, life below water, is that something you have an impact on or can influence? Um, you know, so you have to think of these 17 goals, which of them are important to my stakeholders, which of them are important to me, which of them can I influence? You select a few and you focus on them. So if you want to bring about real change, it is to focus on the key ones relevant to your stakeholders and your business. Um, but really a wonderful and easy to understand goals and framework. Another one to look at is the World Economic Forum, and they've put um, their, their goals or their topics under four broad categories or four pillars. Um, they've got a pillar around principles of governance. There's one around planet, one around people, and one around prosperity. Um, so one could look at, you know, the community and the impact on the community. Uh, I, I, um, it's very easy. Uh, you know, I think principles of governance are so important that we start with governance down at the top. Uh, but then obviously impact on planet, so environment, people, prosperity. Um, they are aligned with the Un United Nations SDGs. Um, they, they've drawn from existing standards and they don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, so they've got 21 core metrics, 34 expanded metrics. Um, and then, you know, you report against those core or expanded metrics considered material and appropriate. Um, and, and you disclose on a compliant, ex, uh, compliant explain basis. Uh, so another, another nice way to maybe group the goals together in four simple um, pillars. Another one to look at is Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Um, you know, companies report issues that are material to their business and industry, and it's in five key categories. So environment, social capital, human capital, business model and innovation, and then leadership and governance. Um, so you can now already see um, there are key themes that cut across all these frameworks, uh, similarities, um, whether it's four pillars or five categories or the 17 goals, um, you know, it's, they are similar themes. Um, the S, uh, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, um, industry specific across 77 industries. Um, it's used most widely, widely in the US. Um, and it's used commonly by investors as a benchmark for industry-specific ESG disclosures. I know in, in natural resources and mining, um, you know, this is a framework often used. So when you think about reaching out to stakeholders and deciding on a framework um, and deciding on the issues you want to measure and report on, it is also important to look what your peers are doing in your industry. Um, because ultimately we know um, stakeholders want comparable information. So that's one of the things to consider. Um, the Global Reporting Initiative, so the GRI, um, you know, this is actually uh, the, the framework most widely used uh, for sustainability reporting. Um, more than 10,000 entities in over 100 countries report in accordance with GRI. Um, including 73% of the world's largest companies report against GRI, very comprehensive. Um, it was already created in 1997. So it's the longest serving set of reporting principles. Um, and the first guidelines around reporting was already issued in the year 2000. Um, another one um, more recent is the TCFDs. So the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Um, I would say this would currently be, be best practice for climate risk disclosures. Um, it's been incorporated into the ratings from major credit rating agencies, um, you know, and it would work well for corporates operating in emissions intensive sectors because it's about climate risk. So coal, oil, gas, aviation, transport, etc. So TCFD, um, if you um, 
if you look at our corporate reporting insights that will be issued next week, um, we've included in there a link to online learning that BDO has developed um, around TCFDs. So what are the TCFDs and to get a better understanding of the TCFDs. Um, so that was released very recently and, and we are putting it on our website and we're putting it in our corporate reporting insights and that go out next week and I'll also put it on LinkedIn. Um, so if you look at all these sustainability reporting frameworks, there are more than 500, I've just touched on a few, there are more than 500 possible reporting frameworks. It's important to remember, however, that every organization has different stakeholders and you have to ask your stakeholders what framework they prefer, what, what matters are important to them. You have to look at your peers, look at the industry. Uh, it's also important to remember that every organization has unique issues. So even if uh, five different organizations all look at the United Nations Sustainability or Sustainable Development Goals, um, they might all five pick um, different key focuses or different goals to focus on. So ESG and sustainability is bespoke to the organization. Um, it's important um, to, to, to not greenwash um, and not just cherry pick. So what I mean by this, it's important that you don't go out to the market and say, we are going to achieve a certain target or uh, objective, right? This is our target. Um, without having in place a clear plan, strategy to achieve that, all right? So a greenwashing is really seen as a, a dirty word in the market. So I say, I say to a lot of my clients, when you do your first sustainability report, let's just very transparent in that first sustainability report, say it how it is. What are we currently doing, baseline reporting? Um, and then let's think about, um, in due course, after we've issued our baseline report, what targets do we want to achieve? Do we think we can achieve? What plans can we put in place to achieve those targets? And only then, after we've got the plan, the strategy, everything in place, do we announce the target? Maybe that goes in the next sustainability report. Um, so we don't want to fall in the trap of greenwashing. Let's open the batting with telling it how it is today. Uh, because the game here, the long game, um, is to improve, to have continuous improvement. It's not about what's in your baseline report. It is how you improve year on year, yeah? And, and how you put policies and procedures and strategy in place to improve year on year. But we have to start somewhere. Um, so this is, um, you know, um, preparation of sustainability reports not mandated yet, assurance not required, just a repeat. Now, the one that gets me super excited, and it's because, I suppose it's because I'm an accounting nerd, um, is the IFRS Foundation that previously was the body overseeing the activities of the International Accounting Standards Board that issue IFRS Accounting Standards, my beloved IFRS Accounting Standards. Um, the IFRS Foundation at COP26 established another standard setting body, the International Sustainability Standards Board. And this International Sustainability Standards Board um, will issue IFRS sustainability disclosure standards. Um, key things here, you'll see on the right hand side, when they established the International Sustainability Standards Board, they've already included in that board, you know, wrapped into it, um, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, um, the TCFDs, um, and some other um, important frameworks and bodies. Um, just two weeks ago, they've actually also included the GRIs. So that fifth one was a new addition. So what they're trying to do is over time, um, get all these existing standing bodies to work with them, incorporate it in their disclosures, build on the good work that these bodies have done. So already five of the key ones already included in the ISSB. <laughs> so that's important. So they're trying to standardize sustainability reporting the way they've standardized accounting standards. And they've got um, 
best practice and they know how to do standard setting. The other thing they've done is they've squarely brought, uh, or they've surely brought, um, sustainability and ESG reporting within the wheelhouse of finance teams. And they are saying, finance teams, you uh, can pr um, put systems and processes in place to prepare financial statements and have it audited. You guys now put systems and processes in place across the business to measure and report and prepare sustainability reports that can be subject to assurance, right? So this is what we as a profession do well. Yes, liaise with HR and liaise with operations and liaise with environmentalists, liaise with the IT people, but ultimately make sure we can pull it together into a sustainability report. Um, so great hopes for the ISSB. Um, the other thing, that's important is shortly after they've established um, the ISSB at COP26 in November, they issued two prototype standards. So the one is general requirements, a catch all kind of standard or prototype standard. And the other one was focused on climate um, based on the work of the TCFDs. You can see it's more or less the same as the TCFDs. Um, my, um, and, and, and the sustainability accounting standards board, the industry disclosures. The technical protocols um, actually go across 581 pages because it's industry by industry. And I think that's knowledge they picked up from the SASB industry disclosure requirements. The good news, um, this is the fastest standard setting I've ever seen. A few year, a weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, it's all blurring at the moment. Um, the ISSB um, turned these prototype standards into exposure drafts. It's open for comment. Um, and I think comment period um, closes end of June. And then it will turn into a standard. And then there will be implementation dates associated with them. So they are moving at a rapid pace. Uh, they started with the catch all general requirements. And over time, they'll add climate and all the other things, diversity, inclusion, modern slavery, all of that will come. Um, but they've started <coughs> with climate change because a lot of things have already happened in that space by other standard setters, and that was the focus at COP26. Um, so we've got a publication on sustainability frameworks, if you want to read about it. Um, you know, w when we speak to um, organisations, we would say this, there are more than 500 frameworks. I think it's more important to pick the themes that are important to your stakeholders and to your business. And we'll talk about that next month. Um, so, you know, which framework is neither here nor there at the moment, but it's the themes that your stakeholders care about and the business care about. That's what's important. Um, because if you look across all of them, they've got very similar approaches and themes. So the next step really is uh, stakeholder engagement. I think before we do that, I would love to get some feedback uh, from you um, around whether you've looked at um, frameworks. So if your organization has committed to sustainability reporting, uh, what frameworks have you adopted? So I've put a few there and there's also an other. You can pick more than one. Um, so you can pick all of them, you can pick two of them, et cetera. Um, if you are picking other, do you mind putting in the chat box for me uh, what other framework you are using? Um, so if you're picking other, I can see a lot of people are, are selecting other. Um, which other ones are you using? So again, thank you very much for your participation. It's really interesting for all attendees and for me to see uh, what you're currently doing. I'll also say, I know it's one minute past 12. I'll be another minute or two and then we're done. So don't stress, we're nearly done. Um, If you still want to respond, please do so. I'll give you five seconds. So five, four, 
three, two, one, and we'll close and we'll share. Uh, so there you can see the TCFDs are popular, 35%. It's been very popular in Australia and it's now uh, folded into the ISSB standard. So if you have adopted TCFDs, you're actually already adopting um, ISSB. Um, then uh, the UN SDGs, 19%, I do love them. GRI, used most broadly across the world. Uh, VRF SASB, I suppose that would be our mining and natural resource clients. And other frameworks, quite a number, if you don't mind putting in the chat box, what are you using? Love to know that. Um, then a final question. Um, what is your current thinking? What do you think um, would be the, the most appropriate um, ESG roadmap for your organization? You know, do you want to say we're not going to do anything or we're just going to put it in the financials or we're just going to put it in the sustainability report or we're going to go for a holistic approach? Uh, remember, there's no right or wrong at this stage. Um, you know, I think the only thing that um, that would raise a, a red flag for me is if you're deciding to do nothing further around sustainability. Um, the way I look at, you know, how people only want to join organizations that make a difference or the way that clients and the supply chain is asking us to address sustainability and ESG. Um, but, you know, other than that, there's no clear right or wrong. Um, if you are thinking no further sustainability action, I would just say think carefully um, what the risks are with that approach and, um, you know, whether there are potentially opportunities that you are missing out on. So again, another five seconds to think about this one and to vote. So five, four, three, two, one. Very interesting, and I'll share it so everybody can see. Um, so there you can see a holistic 25%, an independent sustainability report only, 34%, um, sustainability disclosures with financials, 31%, um, and no further action, 11%. So um, it's fantastic to see that, you know, people are thinking either putting it in financials or putting it separate or have it in both, really. Um, very interesting so thank you very much um so the next step in our journey on our esg roadmap is to do stakeholder engagement uh, you know so we're doing a materiality assessment we reach out to stakeholders we have to think what issues uh, we have to think how relevant these stakeholders are what level of interest influence they have how are we going to engage with them what are the methodologies surveys interviews etc how do we capture and collect the feedback? Um, and what are the priority issues? So that's the next step in our journey. And that's what we'll be discussing next month to assist you on this journey. Um, so I would like to say thank you very much for joining uh, me today. If you need any assistance, if we can help you, please let me know. Um, and also on our website under sustainability reporting, Whatever information I get hold of, I put it there. Um, you'll see that TCFD training, e-learning go on there very shortly. Um, but thank you very much for joining. And now I've gone five minutes over. I do apologize, but I hope I see you again in May. Um, I hope you get some time um, with your family over Easter and Anzac Day, um, some time for reflection, um, and then I'll speak to you. Um, in May. So thank you very much. Take care.